Um, this is my first time presenting on this project without my project co-director, um, whom I'll introduce in a second. Um, and so uh, uh, the first thing I'll say is that I have no technical background. So in answer to, uh, uh, maybe in philology, but not in, uh, in, 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 in computing. So partly in answer to, to, to Tom's question about digital humanities, I'm going to be quite evasive um, and say that uh, I work on a project that's computational. Um, and I believe it falls under the purview of the digital humanities. But I'm not actually going to talk about the digital humanities in any capacious sense um, in the next uh, 40 minutes. Um, this is my project co-director. As you can see from his, um, uh, his PhD, he's a biologist. Um, and you might be wondering, what on earth does a Latinist have to do with a biologist? Um, and I'm actually not going to answer that question now. I'm going to come back to it later. Um, and the story of our collaboration and its origin is also interesting from a pedagogical perspective and is relevant to some of the things I'm going to be talking about. And don't worry, I won't keep you hanging on that as well. I'll, t I'll tell you about that too. Um, if you do have questions about the technical side of the project, the code underlying the tools, um, the biological models that we employ, please don't feel that you can't ask. I'll just forward the questions to Joseph. Um, and he will give you an answer, rather than me garbling what is no doubt um, you know, a complicated and important question. So uh, intertextuality is probably a familiar topic to many of you, um, but I did want to just provide you with a definition from uh, the person who's most closely associated with um, the term and who invented the term, Yulia Kristeva, the Bulgarian-French critic and semiotician. Um, and I picked this quote in particular uh, which is translated, any text is constructed as a mosaic of quotations. Any text is the absorption and transformation of another, primarily because of this word mosaic, actually. Um, and again, you'll see why that word uh, mosaic is important. Um, and intertextuality has really been the bedrock of criticism in Latin literature for, uh, I mean, I would say principally from about the uh, mid-80s onwards, um, associated in particular in the US with the work of people like Richard Thomas uh, and Stephen Hines, uh, and in Italy with Gian Biagio Conte. Um, but really the kind of work that involves systematic comparison of two texts um, goes back to canonical works like Knauer's in the 1960s and much before that too. Now, that definition of intertextuality to some of you will seem particularly narrow. It's a world of illusion and reference. And obviously, intertextuality is more capacious than that. It refers to relationships of the broadest kind, uh, reception histories, and also to microscopic elements of meter and language. So I wanted to give you some example of the narrower kind, because that's where I think the computational tools that we've developed are most instructive and helpful. But uh, while I'm not going to talk about them today, we are working on other tools that approach questions of intertextuality from a larger reception history perspective, looking at the evolutionary histories of, uh, of text. So we, we here have a very simple case uh, of uh, an ancient critic, Lactantius. That's probably not his name. We don't know when he lived. We don't know who he is, really. But this is the name attached to the commentary. Uh, and his commentary is on an ancient epic poem written in the first century AD, Statius as the Bayard. Lactantius, whoever he is, is writing several centuries later. Uh, Lactantius quotes a bit of Statius at the top. I'm going to give you the translation in a second. I just want you to focus on, on the Latin for a second since it shows what our tools uh, do. Um, so Lactantius quotes a little bit of Statius. And then he quotes a comparandum. He quotes Virgil. And we know Statius is thoroughly intertextual with Virgil. Uh, and we have a nice illustration here. And I've just bolded the relevant phrase. Now, what's interesting about these two phrases is they're obviously very similar. You don't need to know Latin to see that they're very similar. But you can also see slight differences, changes in word order, and also changes in spelling. Okay? And immediately, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's going to pose a problem for a search method. right? You can't just search for an exact string and find it because, well, those two words aren't spelled the same. Right? That already poses a certain problem for detecting similarities among texts. And here's the translation. Um, this is obviously a, an example drawn from uh, the, the book I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, and then here is a modern equivalent of precisely what Lactantius was getting at. This is a commentary written in 1991. His, and this is the character, Caponeus, speaking um, in Thebaid uh, 9. His words here recall a speech of Mezentius, a character in Virgil. Okay? So good fodder for the literary critic to work on the ways in which these two characters, these two works might interrelate. Even though the particular example in question might look quite trivial, it's obviously part of a larger network of associations that are 
the, the, the nourishment for any kind of literary critical interpretation that we might engage in. Uh, so, uh, why does intertextuality matter? Uh, I'm going to create an artificial division between language and philology on the one side and, uh, one side and hermeneutics and uh, interpretation on the other. It's an artificial division, but I think it's quite helpful. So, uh, I think intertextuality matters, and again, this is going to be familiar to many of you, uh, because from the perspective of a linguist or a philologist, we want to know whether there are other examples of this phrase or similar examples, whether there are any patterns in their appearance or usage, and what bearing meter or genre might have on usage. Right? That's the kind of thing that a philologist wants to know in the regular course of events. It's the kind of thing any instructor of language wants to impart to a student of language. Right? That's how we want students thinking about language in a technical way. But as literary critics, we also uh, think intertextuality matters because we want to know in this local case what the effect is of Statius using Virgilian phrasing. Why is, why is it that he's using this phrase if there is any specific reason at all? And in what ways do these two characters resemble uh, or differ from one another? Right? Is there a way in which intertextuality can help us think about um, a particular text as a locus for similarity or difference? And what literary reasons might account for differences in phrasing? Is there some kind of significance that goes beyond just fitting a formula into a particular metrical rhythm, for instance? So uh, I'm going to introduce you to three tools. Some of you, I know there are a couple of classes here, are going to be very familiar with these. I'm going to introduce you to three tools which are not in each case designed to detect intertextuality, but that's how they're used. Two of them are designed to detect intertextuality. One of them is a browsing and searching tool, the first one, which is instrumental for most classes in finding intertext. Um, I'm gonna talk about three of them briefly, focus obviously more closely on my own project, um, and then I wanna talk about some other things like pedagogical uses towards the end of the presentation. So, uh, this is Diogenes. Uh, it's a browsing and searching tool. Now the key thing to know about this tool, uh, it's freely accessible, you can download it. It is completely useless on its own, okay? The way in which this tool works is to use text provided by the Packard Humanities Institute or the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae, texts of Latin and texts of Greek respectively. Um, huge, uh, high quality corpora of those texts. Um, it uses those texts as the basis for its browsing and searching, so you need access to those texts. Um, this has changed recently, uh, so the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae has um, a, a kind of an abbreviated version that you can search online freely. Um, it has a more expanded version that you probably have institutional access to through your institutions. Um, the uh, Latin equivalent is now available online. The reason why I'm still presenting on Diogenes is because it is an exquisite tool for searching those corpora. It remains the best tool out there. Um, nothing uh, I'm going to say about these three tools suggests that one replaces the other. Our hope is that they work complementarily uh, and are useful to all literary critics and to, and to teachers of language. Uh, so uh, you can still get a free CD-ROM of uh, the Packard Humanities Institute Latin text, by the way, if any of you still has a CD-ROM drive. Um, so <laughs> I, ma I, I mail ordered a couple the, the other year. Um, so uh, Diogenes um, is designed by Peter Heslin, a classicist at Durham. Um, it was originally de designed in 1999, but the latest version is from 2007. Um, it's a tool for searching and browsing, as I said, and not just Greek and Latin literary texts, but also papyri. Um, the method is exact matching, okay? and this is key, right? because we're talking about ways of detecting similarities between texts, and already we've seen that sometimes these similarities are inexact or imprecise. Um, right? Anytime you kind of look for something using control F, right? I mean, you know there are some restrictions on what you can find. Um, here, your options for flexibility include wildcards or partial words, and I'll show you how you might get at uh, the result that I showed you earlier using Diogenes even though those two words are spelt differently. It has numerous other useful features um, when you uh, go to a bit of text and you click on a word, it gives you the definition drawn from uh, a, the dictionaries provided by the Perseus project, for instance, um, and there are various other features that are really very useful, and it's routinely used by classicists, many of whom, like me, have no particular technical background, and I cannot emphasize enough how important that is. Any kind of intimidation in the technical um, ability required to use a tool renders it completely useless, basically, um, even if the tool is quite useful um, in itself. This is routinely used by classicists, which is great. So, uh, 
I put in some search parameters. You can see here that I put in the uh, first four letters, D-E-X-T, from that phrase we looked at. Um, I put in square brackets, E-R, so it would search for D-E-X-T-E -E or D-E-X-T-R to encompass both possibilities. To be honest, I could have just left that out and just wrote, written D-E-X-T and it would have been fine. And I wrote the word uh, for me, mihi, um, and uh, I said find these two words within a phrase in a pre-selected corpus of five epics and 10 tragedies. So that's pretty sizable. I mean, we're talking about many thousand lines uh, of Latin. I mean, sure, it's not like searching Google Books or something like that, but we're talking about really targeted searches here. Um, and I picked this um, set of texts because it forms the uh, test corpus for our own project as well. So I wanted to use the same, uh, the same search corpus. Um, the results, the results come almost immediately. I mean, one of the great things about Diogenes, because it's doing exact searching, is that the results appear very fast. Um, there were 20 results, and you can immediately see here the result that uh, we were interested from book nine. Um, and you can see that it captures both forms. Right? So it's a really great tool. Uh, you can just click on the context and get access to the, uh, the, the passage from which the verse appears, or prose. Um, it gives you very clearly the line reference. Um, and as I said, because it's based on these databases of high quality text, right, that's kind of a big deal in classics, right? Our texts aren't all of the same quality. Um, we have access to a lot of text through things like the Latin Library, for instance, but a lot of those are free texts, right, out of copyright. Um, sometimes there are uh, typographical errors. And the quality of that text matters hugely. Um, both for just getting the text right and not having um, garbled information as a researcher, but it's also difficult for students if they're confronted with text where they, there's a mistake in the text or there's something funny about it that hasn't been um, corrected by an editor. Um, so it's great that it's able to use these high quality texts. There are some developments in that area that I can talk about in the Q&A um, that probably gonna, aren't gonna come online for a few years, but there are some developments in the area to make higher quality text accessible to um, the general public freely. So uh, that's tool number one, Diogenes, which has been around, as I said, from 1999, although probably it's only been used uh, a good deal from the early 2000s. In 2008, um, a project uh, began at SUNY Buffalo, led by Neil Coffey, um, <laughs> again a classicist, uh, and uh, Tesserae uh, means mosaic, um, or mosaic tiles, and you can see the logo uh, is made up of mosaic tiles, hence why I chose that particular quotation from uh, Kristeva, right? They're drawing on uh, Kristeva's image of the mosaic, uh, and this tool is designed precisely to detect intertextuality. Now, uh, I talked about intimidation, right? Looking at um, a, a, an interface for a tool and how it can be off-putting. Um, and actually, I deliberately put this up because it is a little off-putting. This is not their launch page. What I've done is I've shown you the advanced features, which are fantastic. It's really good to have these features, but I just wanted to just put in your mind the thought, well, I as a user, and it doesn't really matter whether you work in Latin or Arabic or whatever, because part of the point of this presentation is to show what we do in Latin uh, or in Greek, right? And for you to think about maybe how you might incorporate similar tools um, in your own instruction, in your own languages. Um, I hope that's one of the outcomes of today, that we think about the different tools that are employed in different languages and how we might um, collaborate and export them. Well, if you face something like this, and you weren't very technically or linguistically minded, you might actually just be put off. So they've done a very clever thing, which is that their launch page actually just, just causes all of this to disappear, or just doesn't show it to begin with. And you have to actively reveal it. So what you have is uh, just these six boxes at the top. And here's where Tesserai's insight is, uh, um, is, is fantastic. So Tesserai uh, decided, instead of targeted queries, where you input a particular phrase that you're looking for, they decided, why don't we just have global comparison of two texts? So what you're interested in is not this particular phrase in Statius or in Virgil, but I'm just interested in Statius and Virgil and their interrelationship generally. So how am I gonna find the intertext between these two works? So uh, what you put in is a target text and a source text, and it, uh, the program, uh, will focus on two word phrases. So the, the intuition is that two word phrases, um, whether relatively banal ones, like Mickey Dextra, my right hand, or less banal ones, um, that those two word phrases are the core of intertextual, elusive, uh, or referential language. 
Um, and so it, uh, the program will uh, show you all common two word phrases and this is the important next step, it has a scoring system to identify into texts of greatest interest. And it does that um, by ranking uh, the phrases according to the relative infrequency of terms because you're going to be more interested in two word phrases where the terms are rarer rather than having words like me or um, you know, verbs like be in them. You're gonna be interested in more substantive um, uh, and uh, rarer uh, language or diction. Uh, and there are several experimental tools in addition to the core um, intralingual search. So there are some cross-linguistic um, search tools uh, which are experimental um, and we can talk a little bit about that at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and the great thing about Tesserae is that they have a very quantitative systematic approach to evaluating their tools. They have very impressive benchmarks for the discovery of meaningful intertext. The work was published uh, in the Transactions of the American Philological Association in 2012 um, with a, a partner piece uh, in what was then uh, Literary and Linguistic Computing, also in 2012, um, on the underlying um, technical aspects. Um, and what they showed was that you could recover a lot of the references that we see in scholarly commentaries. You could recover them using this tool. Um, now, this is what Tesserai output looks like. I don't want you to read the individual words. I know it's very small. I just want you to get a quick visual picture of what the output looks like. Um, there are numbers that I took off the side, starting with one and just going down. But the important thing is you have the reference uh, in your target text, the reference in your source text, and you can clearly see uh, the, the line in question highlighted in red, the um, etymological uh, or linguistic similarities. Um, the particular words um, in the two word phrase um, are set aside here um, and then there's the score based on the metric of the relative infrequency of the word. It's also based on a distance metric, i.e. words that are closer together in a phrase, so it's treated more as a, as a tight unit, score more highly where the, the, than cases where the two words are further apart. Now, um, there's uh, an obvious problem with this, um, which uh, they very much take account of, which is that you generate an awful lot of results. If you look at the top there, I, you probably can't make it out of the back, but there are 828 results just for a comparison of, this isn't the whole work, this is just of book nine of the Thabayad and book 10 of the Aeneid, right? That's a huge amount of data to plow through. Now the scoring method certainly helps in that it reduces, you can presumably just not look at anything below a six, um, and in the advanced search feature, there's an option to just not look at um, anything below six, seven, eight, or nine. Um, but nevertheless, you're gonna get a lot of information. Um, and plowing through that is going to require some expertise in the language yourself, right? This is not a tool for amateurs. Now, because of the nature of the intertexts that are identified, you're also gonna get things that aren't very significant. Um, one of the things that Tesserai has done very well is to explain the difference between, uh, and I know that literary theorists have been doing this for a long time, but it's very useful to see this in the context of a, um, a digital humanities discussion, the difference between meaningfulness and significance, literary significance. So what we get in a lot of these cases are meaningful comparanda, right? Phrases that are similar in some way that as philologists or linguists or people who are interested in commentary or people who are interested in teaching students about similarities and uh, what have been referred to as code models. Um, so language that's generically similar but not necessarily significantly similar for a literary critic. Um, Tessera have been very good at explaining how this tool is very effective at giving you those code models in a systematic way. Um, I mean, for a long time, uh, literary critics have had intuitions about generic language, but this is a fantastic way of establishing um, quantitatively uh, and demonstrably um, the, the, the basis for similarities in generic language um, between authors. Um, and in fact, there's a project currently led by Neil Bernstein at Ohio, um, Kyle Gervais at Western Ontario and Wei Lin, also at Ohio, uh, where they use Tesserae to ascertain which epic poets in Latin 
are following which particular epic models and to what extent using this kind of large-scale systematic test as the basis for their analyses. And that's coming out in Digital Humanities Quarterly this year. Um, I think it's forthcoming in the next month or so. So uh, this is a very brief account of um, Tesserae's strengths. Um, it takes account of semantics, by the way, as well as morphology, although that's not immediately clear from these examples. That was a recent addition in 2015. So um, it looks at the definitions of the words in English. Um, and so even when there isn't necessarily um, a direct Latin etymological equivalent between two words, um, the semantic uh, equivalency between them uh, will cause them to score more highly. Um, and the processing time is fast. It's not as fast as Diogenes, right? I'm sure for obvious reasons because of the number of calculations required, but it's still pretty fast. And again, that's important. I mean, it sounds trivial, but I mean, all of you have sat in front of a computer and attempted to you know, load something or use a tool, and it's very off-putting if something isn't, 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 isn't rapid. Okay, here's where the biology comes in. This is the slide that I'm most nervous about, so. It's, it's kind of shock and awe, and that shock and awe will disappear if you ask me questions about it. So, um, okay, so uh, the motivation for our own tools, I've told you about two tools now, Diogenes and Tesserae, Tesserae relatively new. This is brand new. Um, in fact, our first interface um, is not yet publicly available, although it is available by arrangement. If you wanna play around with this tool, um, then just ask me and I'll give you the password and you're welcome to use the website and play around with it. It's so new that we face the typical problems that you know, people who create new tools do. The server crashes, you know, I have to phone system admins and say, please help, you know, someone's trying to access the tool. Um, and they've been extremely helpful in, 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 in addressing any problems. Um, our method is based on something called sequence alignment. And sequence alignment um, is a technique used in uh, biology and computational biology and systems biology um, for highlighting regions of conservation and dissimilarity in a protein. Um, and that's extremely helpful for understanding what the functional, structural, or evolutionary role of a protein is uh, by looking at its, the presence or absence of certain um, amino acid sequences um, in various um, uh, organisms. Uh, and uh, this is just a, um, a, a, a random um, uh, figure from a paper uh, by someone in Joseph's group, my, my, my uh, co-director's group um, at, um, uh, at Harvard. Um, but you can see any number of sequence alignment figures like this um, in science journals. Um, BLAST, uh, the basic local alignment search tool, um, is an algorithm for more efficient aligning of sequences, and it's really standard in bioinformatics. Um, and uh, the paper presenting it came out in 1990, um, and um, you, know, you can go and have a look at it. Um, I mean, I can't really make head or tail of the detail, but um, if you look at it, just visually, if you look at the tool, um, you'll see the um, intuitive connection to the kind of thing we're doing. Uh, now, sequence alignment has been used for language. It has been used in natural language processing um, for text reuse um, and plagiarism detection. There's a really great paper um, by Olson. Carl, I don't know whether you know this, because it's actually based on a French corpus. Um, and uh, it looks uh, for sequences, obviously, sequences of words that match from one text to another. Um, I mean, one could say, well, you know, our, motive, uh, our inspiration comes from the natural language processing um, origin, but actually that's just not the case because I just happen to work with a biologist. So actually it does in fact come from the, the original biological um, uh, instantiation of the technique. So here's the core difference about what we're doing. We're not looking at sequence alignment of words. We're looking at sequence alignment of characters. And as far as we're aware, that hasn't been done before. Uh, and uh, for calculating the difference between two strings, remember we're looking for inexact <coughs> matches, right? Exact matches are easy to find. What we're interested in is sequences of characters, i.e. words that differ in some respect or other, but are not radically different, right? They're similar enough that they may be of literary significance. Uh, so edit distance is a measure of character by character similarity. Here's a really simple example just drawn from the Wikipedia article on edit distance, I think. Um, and it shows you how we score a change from one word to another word here uh, with three additions, substitutions, or deletions. Um, in this case, one substitution, two substitutions, and then a third um, addition. So this is our uh, 
this is our, uh, uh, our interface. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's very rudimentary. Um, as you know, the final version will not look like this, but this is very functional. Um, and it's quite clean, which um, is helpful for the people uh, testing it and cleaning it. Um, so the way this works is by you inputting a query. Um, so in that respect, it's closer to Diogenes than it is to Tesserae. Um, although again, I'll come back to that um, in the end. I'll, it's not the last word on it. Um, but you input a phrase of interest you specify the maximum edit distance that you're willing to tolerate. Now intuitively, if you specify a very large edit distance for a very short phrase, you're going to get all the results. <laughs> you're just gonna get the entirety of the text. If you specify a very small edit distance for a very long sequence of words or characters, you will get zero results except for the identical phrase itself. Um, so that's a, just an intuitive way of thinking about how one uses edit distance. Um, we've recently added some new functionality, so uh, you can align either the whole phrase continuously, starting from the first letter and looking for all matches for every single letter in a line, or you can align each word separately in the query. So the program will look in a phrase like Dextra Mihi for every match starting with Dextra, every match starting with Mihi, um, and it, in, including any gaps between the words. So that's the number of words in range function. Um, you can, and, and that allows you to uh, align your search query with non-adjacent words. And remember, um, for some languages, especially um, you know, a language like Latin, there's huge flexibility in word order. So it's actually, it's, it's not gonna be useful if you were restricted to just looking for matches of uh, phrases that are just considered as single sequences. Latin poets all the time will move phrases around so that a word is at the beginning of the line and its counterpart is at the end of the line. So you do need that option, especially for studying uh, a language like Latin. And then there are various options uh, for corpus uh, selection um, here that I, I mean, I won't go into the details, but I just wanted to acknowledge that Tesserae helped us out a lot with um, just making uh, the text accessible uh, more rapidly. We had a parser for, um, uh, for making a lot of the free texts usable, but theirs was simply better. They had, they had some experience doing this from, uh, from further back. And, and, and actually, that's not an insignificant point. Um, I mean, I was saying last night over dinner that one of the nice things about the digital humanities community, even though we're talking about two very much, two projects that are very much based in classics rather than the digital humanities, is that it has been, at least in my experience, a very welcoming community. And even though we are in some sense in competition, it has never felt that way. Uh, and we've been very, uh, I, mean, I hope, we've, we've helped each other a lot. And certainly I'm very grateful to Tesserae um, for, the, for the help they've given us. So uh, some sample output from our tool. I put in the phrase Dextra Mihi. You can see here, no wildcards. I just put in the phrase that I was interested in. I imposed a very low cutoff just for the purposes of, of this exercise. Um, I said, you know, give me any order. Um, a range of two means I actually wasn't in this case looking for um, the individual words separated with any gaps in between any intervening words. I was actually just looking for the words in either order. Um, and we can see that one of the advantages, and I mean, here we, we can see a, the capturing of the two relevant intertexts from um, uh, Aeneid 10 up at the top um, and uh, Thabaya 9 down at the bottom. Um, but we can immediately see that one of the advantages of edit distance is because it is blind to diction, semantics, et cetera, all it's doing is calculating character by character similarity. Um, it actually is good at uh, including spelling variations like dextra and dextera, because when you, uh, uh, you, know, you have a difference like that, all you're doing is adding a cost of an edit distance of one, which is relatively insignificant. Um, it's not non-significant, but it's relatively insignificant. So it's a nice way of capturing those small variations, which could be spelling variations, they could be orthographic variations. Um, it's a nice way of doing that. But, and this is probably most interesting, um, if you look, and I know it's gonna appear small to the people at the back, but if you look under Ovid Metamorphoses, the, the entry at 13361, you can see the phrase tibi dextra. Tibi here means uh, to you or for you or your in this case. Well, that's in no way like mihi, me. I have a pronoun, sure, but 
right? It's a different word. The way that, edit, uh, that sequence alignment can capture this is purely through the similarity in character between Tibby and Mickey, right? The substitution of T and M, right, and H and B. Um, and so you're able to catch phrases that are related to your search query, but are crucially different in a way that would be challenging for Diogenes um, and for Tesserae, okay? And again, I say that not at all as a criticism. It's just that you want to use these tools in a complementary way to capture the broadest range of intertext. So I want to give you two more examples. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I work a lot on Flavian epic. That was one of the, the core, this is a, the epic poetry written in the late first century AD. Um, and one of the reasons I work on that poetry, um, uh, or one of the advantages, sorry, that I have in working on that poetry is that there's been a lot of interest in it over the last 20 years. Um, and that's fantastic because it means there are a lot of scholarly resources to work with. Um, and <clears throat> they're, they're recent, uh, and so they employ the full range of intertextual techniques, not the search techniques, but the interpretive techniques um, that have been built over the last 20 years. And also, and this is key, those texts of the late first century AD have models that are extant. We actually can read Virgil and Ovid, who are the models for these late first century AD texts. The problem with doing intertextual search for Virgil and Ovid is we don't have their predecessors. We have fragments of Ennius, we have very, very few fragments of uh, other Republican epic poets. So it's pretty hard to do any kind of intertextual search. You have no corpus to work with if what you're looking for is prior reference and allusion. The great thing about working with late first century AD texts is you do have their principal models. So especially if you're testing a method, you actually have scholarship that tells you what kinds of references and allusions there are, and you can measure your results against that scholarship. You just can't do that if you don't have an extant corpus to work with. Um, so it's a huge advantage in working with late first century um, AD epic. Um, so I put in a phrase from uh, this poem. Um, this is Silas Italicus' Punica, an epic on the, the, the Second Punic War, the Hannibalic War. I put in this phrase, um, and uh, it's the same target corpus, the 15 works, five epics, uh, 10 tragedies. And we can see here this phrase in Virgil's Aeneid, which is a really famous phrase in Virgil's Aeneid where the goddess Juno says, if I can't turn the gods, then I will move hell. Um, and uh, this occurs in the middle of the Aeneid. Uh, and the phrase is akeronta movebo. The phrase that I put in is akeronta videbo, I will see Acheron or I will see hell. Well, I will see and I will move have no kind of linguistic relationship to each other except in their morphology, their first person singular future um, active indicatives. That's the only thing that's similar about them, okay? So again, most computational search techniques are not gonna be able to give you that parallel, and it's a clear parallel for reasons that I won't go into. Um, but this technique will give that to you because the edit distance cost of getting from Videbo to Movebo is very small, it's only three. All you need to do is change those first three letters. And you're starting to get a sense of the, the compositional technique of a poet here, right? So the poet has a phrase in mind, there's a desire to alter the phrase, right, to generate new meaning. You alter the phrase in some way the, where it's recognizably elusive to a prior model, right, enough so the reader gets some satisfaction from it, from identifying it, gets some meaning from the relationship between these two texts. Um, but nevertheless, there is this, there is this key difference there. Um, and sequence alignment provides you a way uh, of detecting these, uh, these intertexts. Um, now, you could say, well, you could, you could, you could find this, um, this intertext just by looking up the word Acheron, because Acheron can't be that, um, can't be that uh, infrequent. And that's true. Uh, sorry, can't be that frequent. And that's true, right? It appears 27 times in this target corpus. You could look through 27 examples and you would find your parallel. Okay, so let me give you a slightly different example. So yeah, so uh, Movebo and Videbo, hourly similar, but semantically different. Uh, I couldn't give you the search parameters for this, but I uh, looked for a phrase, commune nefas, a collective evil. These texts that really dwell on collective evil I mean, and, and hell. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I, which is a really important programmatic phrase at the beginning of Lucan's poem on the Civil War, 
written just before um, Silius uh, Italicus um, and Statius. So this is in the middle of the first century AD. Again, hugely intertextual with Virgil. Um, and I wanted to show you two interesting comparanda. Um, so the phrase commune nefas that I looked for occurs, as you can see, just under Lucum Bellum uh, Kibula, uh, commune nefas 1-6. Um, and the two phrases, the two comparanda that I'm most interested in are one, the, uh, the direct um, identical uh, uh, phrase in uh, Seneca's Thyestes, that's a tragedy by Lucan's uncle. So he's clearly getting this language from his uncle's writing. Uh, but here's another interesting comparandum. Virgil's Aeneid um, in uh, a passage located in the underworld in book six, famous passage of the Aeneid, Imane Nefas, which refers to the worst possible crimes committed by the paradigmatic sinners in the underworld, so Titios and Ixion, um, figures like Tantalus, figures like that. Um, uh, and what's interesting about Commune Nefas and Imane Nefas is precisely, again, that they are hourly similar, Commune and Imane, but in fact, they bear no etymological relationship at all. Um, I think there's literary significance there. Lucan's very interested in putting um, hell very much on earth in the civil war fought between Caesar and Pompey. Um, and uh, Lucan is thoroughly intertextual with Virgil systematically over the course of his poem. Uh, but again, you're not going to find that intertext through conventional means. Sequence alignment allows you to detect it at a relatively low edit distance, um, showing you the aural similarity. Now, Nefas, unlike Acheron, occurs very, very frequently in these works because they're so concerned with wrongdoing and evil. And so you're going to have to go through 256 instances if you want to find these parallels. So now we're starting to see the benefit of sequence alignment as an efficiency, uh, as an efficient method uh, of detecting um, intertextuality. Uh, we, like Tesserae, uh, have ongoing work to systematically validate the method. Um, we're using another Flavian poet, another first century AD poet called Valerius Flaccus, because there are three recent commentaries, two from the late 2000s, one from mid to late 2000s, one from the 90s or early 2000s, uh, which gives us a lot of conventional scholarship against which to measure the success rate of sequence alignment at recovering um, intertexts. Um, there are again are 15 texts in the comparison corpus. You don't need to look at the details on this chart since it, it's going to appear quite small. The key thing is this is a snapshot of the kind of um, validation data that we have. You have um, the Valerius Flaccus reference, the intertext reference, the commentary in which the intertext is noted, and then uh, a note on whether the intertext has been recovered or not. Um, we uh, have been very impressed with the success rate. So far, um, we've managed to recover 385 out of 451 parallels. Um, for about 400 lines of the text, which is about half the book. Um, it's not a faultless method. Um, in some cases, the number of results in which the key result appears is, is reasonably large. Um, so this is obviously going to need to be refined over time. But it's extremely promising as an automated uh, method of detecting um, intertextual parallels. But it isn't just about detecting intertextual parallels in text that we know to be intertextually connected. These tools have to be helpful with new applications and well, as well. And this is, in some ways, the thing that I'm most excited about, and also the area in which I'm, I'm most ignorant. Um, it, you'll probably have some sense that classicists work on classic poetry, right? uh, or, or, or prose. Right? We work on the period of classical antiquity, uh, broadly conceived. But there are good arguments that we should be working on Latin and Greek wherever they're found, including in early modernity. But actually, Neo-Latin is relatively relatively poorly studied. I mean, there are obviously great specialists in Neo-Latin, but as a proportion of the greater community that works on either early modernity or Latin, it, it's actually a very, very small number. Um, one of the great things we can do is aid people who want to work on Neo-Latin text, right, but don't have the time or the energy to read thoroughly in Neo-Latin. Apart from anything, the employability level if you work on Neo-Latin is not exactly great. Um, so, uh, what we want to do is provide an option for uploading, and this is all very temporary, I mean, this is you know, brand new, is providing an, up, an option for uploading a text file that has a Neo-Latin text. In it. Actually, Neo-Latin has a lot of uh, online text available. It's, it's reasonably well supported in that, in that, in that sense. 
Um, and so you can uh, search for intertext um, it using this target file that you've uploaded. Um, so uh, I took an example of a 15th century uh, play written by uh, this guy who's very young at the time, he's 18. Um, he then has this religious conversion where he says, I'm never gonna write any Latin poetry again because it's, uh, he doesn't explicitly say it, but it's very clear that he has a turning away from it as being somewhat corrupting. Um, so uh, when he's very young, he's a great Latinist, uh, and he composes the Senecan style tragedy. So I searched for this phrase um, in a passage that I know is uh, intertextual with uh, uh, Correa's progny. Um, and we can see, so I searched for a two word phrase, umbrarum arbiter, you can see there, and then a three word phrase here. And we can see this result, furiarum agmena or dira furiarum agmena. And I've put it in bold here, right at the bottom. What's interesting about this comparandum is that none of those words are the same, right? Not a single one of those words is the same. But hear the sound of it, duro sumbrarum arbiter, dira furiarum agmena. The rhythm is the same, right? Some of the key sounds are the same, di, ar, arum, a, right? If that wasn't enough to convince you, look at the rest of the language, right? Adite, adi, right? Poinas is, uh, appears there and is also uh, a synonym for supplicia, right? Sequid, sequid. Um, so these passages are, I mean, incontrovertibly intertextual, right? Korea is using um, uh, Seneca very, very explicitly here. But sequence alignment allows you to see the close similarity in sound, right? And sound is crucial to poetry. If we can impart that to students by using this method and showing how poets compose using sound just as they do uh, uh, meaning, right? That's a huge benefit. So just a couple more slides and then um, I'll turn it over to questions. So the strengths and weaknesses of sequence alignment. It's really good uh, at par finding parallel phrases where one word is in common but the other is or are merely similar in sound, although I've given you a blockbuster case where none of the words uh, is similar. Um, you can have uh, a lot of fine tuning and controlling the cutoff, i.e. the maximum edit distance that you want to accommodate. Um, the disadvantages, interesting results, can easily be a lost amongst copious, largely uninteresting output, um, which uh, is actually worse than tesserae. The nice thing about tesserae is even results that aren't hugely interesting often are somewhat interesting, whereas in a lot of cases with sequence alignment, you're getting garbage. Um, processing time is slow for large corpora. This is a real problem. It's actually, it, it's apparently, and I, again, please don't ask me about this, but uh, there was a paper published um, this last, this past summer that pr showed provably that sequence alignment for um, uh, extremely large uh, data sets was impossible if you wanted a uh, global comparison of sequence alignment. If you're searching for an individual phrase, that's fine. Um, if you're searching a small passage against a, a, a large text, that's fine. If you wanted a global comparison of the form that Tesserae does, you couldn't use sequence alignment unless you, to, you were to apply some kind of efficiency heuristics, and we're exploring that possibility, but um, there, are some, there are some computational obstacles there. So future development, we're gonna try parallelized search. We just need to find, as I say, some heuristics. Uh, we would like to have even finer tuning um, and we would like to incorporate some uh, significance weighting. And this is hopefully gonna be interesting to a number of people. We would like to extend it to other languages, beginning with ancient Greek, obviously, since we're familiar with that. But um, uh, we think that this could be useful for, for many other languages as well. Um, I want to uh, cite the contributions, uh, or, or at least describe the contributions of undergraduate and other research assistants, because I think that's uh, really crucial for understanding how these projects develop um, and the, what the possibilities are uh, for the future for pedagogy as well. Um, so this is lists some of the things that undergraduates uh, and, and high school students have done. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge the contribution of someone in this room, Adriana. Um, so Adriana Casares is a former UT, uh, she's a UT alum. Actually, I, I, I poached her from my wife who teaches in the classics department here. Um, and Adriana is now a high school Latin teacher in Austin uh, and has been hugely instrumental in, being, uh, in, in enabling us to do the, the work that we do. Um, and this kind of partnership with teachers, uh, with high school students, um, uh, and with undergraduates is crucial to the success of this kind of enterprise. There's a lot of desire out there and there are a lot of skills out there that can be leveraged. Um, it takes time and it takes energy to coordinate all of this, but 
um, if you're able to do it, there's, there's a lot of benefits to be seen there. Very briefly, uh, I want to talk about computation and intertextuality in the classroom. Um, so in addition to independent research um, and collaboration on, on, on research projects, um, I did teach a class in the winter called Virgil in the Digital Age, which was an advanced Latin course where we used these three search tools to read passages of Latin. And students were asked um, what is and what is not an interesting intertext and why. There's a crucial difference in doing this on the basis of commentaries, traditional research just as I would, and to do it using computational techniques. Um, it really puts the onus on the student to process a large amount of data and really think through the pertinent literary critical questions, the philological questions. Um, uh, the, are there frustrations? Absolutely. Um, there are a lot of technical difficulties. Some students are intimidated by the use of some of the tools. Um, but you can overcome them. I certainly think the benefits outweigh uh, the disadvantages. And I'm sure part of that was also down to my relative inexperience in teaching a course for the first time that incorporates technical matter, especially when I have no particular technical background. I do think it was worth it, nevertheless. What are the pros? Enhanced reading, naturally incorporating criticism and research just in the process of reading a foreign language. Um, final thoughts. Um, I think classics is an unusually privileged position because of the amount of work that's been done in computation and digitization, uh, because our corpora, relatively speaking, are quite small compared to English. Um, and so it allows us uh, a good deal of expertise in a narrow area, which obviously with English uh, is, is a little bit um, uh, it's a little bit uh, challenging to know an entire field with classics. I don't know that you know an entire field, but you know a good proportion of it. Um, uh, sharing an extension of resources with uh, and to other languages, I think, is going to be crucial uh, for the development not only of our project but of uh, the field uh, as a whole. Um, I uh, am very pleased by the collaboration between uh, me and my, my co-director, Joseph, because it's a substantive collaboration between humanists and scientists, not only to answer historical or material questions, this is crucial, but to support criticism, which I see as fundamental to what the humanities is. Um, I uh, think there are opportunities that I've kind of alluded to for the use of these tools for digital pedagogy in the classroom um, and uh, for showcasing novel opportunities for collaborative research that are attractive um, to people who want to, to, to um, uh, try things that they would normally do in a lab, maybe, or they would do, they would do you know, in bioinformatics, but they could also now do um, in a humanistic environment. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot for us to, to, to talk about here over the course of today. Uh, these are uh, some of the people that I work with, some of the officers that have supported us. Um, I'm happy to tell you about the origin of my collaboration with Joseph at some later point, but for now, thank you very much.